Good morning. I'm admitting people, so that's why I'm not talking. I'm trying to admit people and take attendance at the same time, make sure I've gotten them. Uh -huh. Oh. Yes, I hear you. Oh. Okay. And yeah, it's too dark. I think the light off. Hey, Gina. Hi, Maureen. Good morning, Maureen. Good morning. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I'm still oh, taking attendance. Good thing it's that it's a big class. Here we go. Good morning, morning. Okay. All right. Let's see if there's anybody else that we're missing. Hello, Maureen. Here I am. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Looks like we have a lot of people. Probably not everybody yet, but um. So I'll get started. Oh, uh, and I'll watch for new people that are joining. Um. Good morning, and thanks for joining us for um our fifth uh no sixth session of national parks we have two more classes after this one today we're going to finish up with our glacier parks talking about um some areas around the great lakes and then um and we'll also start with the cave parks i probably won't finish all of those yet this week um i would like to um thank everyone who has donated. We have some people who are, were wonderful participants and sent in donations to us, and that really helps us keep our um, our programs going. Uh, looks like we may be doing this online stuff for a while, so we really appreciate any uh, donations that you have the, you know, are are able to make. We're offering the classes for free right now, but uh, they're still trying to keep us all working and uh, keeping our programs going. So we really appreciate any support that you have given us or can give us. Um, I have a couple of new classes for June. Um, for the May classes, if, if you know anybody who still wants to register for this class or if you want to register for the, um, the Modern China class, China Now, you can email me and I will put you on those. But for the classes that are starting in June, we are, um, registering online on the Tallahassee uh, Senior Foundation website. The registration is already open and up there. So you can go on there and it says, it, it has a little tab that says register for virtual classes. And um, the two classes that I have coming up are the one that starts on June 4th and it's taught by Dr. Josh, Josh Goodwin, Got Josh Goodman, can't talk this morning, from the State Archives and it's Florida at the Crossroads of Empire from 1513 to 1821. It's a Florida history class. Josh is a wonderful um, uh, presenter. So um, it, he's a, we're really lucky to have him. It's a real treat to listen to him. So if you like history, that's definitely one you might want to sign up for. And then on June 16th, oh, Josh's class is on Thursday afternoons, 1.30. Um, Tuesday mornings at one or Tuesday afternoons at 1.30, we have um, a class on June 16th starting on Mars, and that's by uh, Dr. Steve Bloomsack, and that'll be a three-week class. 
And both of those are up on our um, website on the Tallahassee Senior Foundation.org website to register. It's the same type of registration that we have for uh, L3X. If you've done that before, you already have um, a login, which you can log in either by your username that you made up or by your email. Either one of those should work. And um, it, you know, if you don't remember your password, you should be able to change that. Uh, so you go ahead and try to start registering for those. And uh, if, you know, if, if you really, uh, you know, if you can't um, remember how to do it, we are gonna put up some directions on how to do that. Or um, you can email me and maybe I can give you some tips. But uh, anyway, uh, hopefully people will start registering for those online. Uh, I think. How long did you say the um, the Florida history class was going to be? It's going to be four weeks. Thank you. Four weeks on uh, starting on June fourth. It'll be the month through the month of June. The okay. Mars class starts on June sixteenth, and that's three weeks. Thank you. Um, okay. And then the other thing I wanted to say is please mute yourselves unless you have a question. And if, while I'm talking, if you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself. That way we don't have background noise from other people's uh, houses, just the background noise from my house, which hopefully will be kept from a minimum. Hopefully my dog won't bark. So, okay. We are probably ready to get started. Um, unless anybody has any questions, other questions. Okay. I am going to go. Okay, so today we're um, continuing with our glacier parks. There's another person. Um, we're continuing with our glacier parks and um, and we're going to get up into the, the Great Lakes. And we're basically just going to talk about some parks in Michigan. Um, one of them is a national park and two of them are national lake shores. And um, we're going to talk and these are all, the, you know, all glaciers that were, you know, the, the Pleistocene ice sheet. Uh, helped with the formation of these. So we're just going to be concentrating on the big Pleistocene ice sheet uh, type, uh, glacial formation today. So here are our Great Lakes. Um, they are, here's, and we're going to concentrate, two of the areas we're going to be uh, concentrating on are Lake Superior and then one is on the shore of Lake Michigan. So Superior is the biggest one and then Mich there's Michigan, Huron, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. And all of the Great Lakes were formed from when the, as the Pleistocene ice sheet melted and retreated and they were, they were scoured out by the, you know, glacier, by the ice sheet and then uh, blocked by moraine and filled with meltwater. So that's basically how our Great Lakes formed. Um, and then this actually shows the Great Lakes formation as the ice sheet retreated. So here was 14,000 years ago. You can see they're just starting. So the ice sheet is starting to melt. And then 9,000 years ago, um, you know, quite a bit more of them, but there's still a lot of ice sheets 7,000 years ago. And, um, and then here we go, 4,000 years ago, um, you know, it's, it's, they're all formed. So they're very, very recent geologically. That's the, you know, that's, they've got some very old rocks in them, but they're very recent uh, geological formations, the actual lakes. I have a couple of um, videos on the lakes. Um, one of them is just kind of on the Great Lakes. And then another one is, is a, a visual just showing the retreat of the ice sheets. So this first one is a little bit longer. Hopefully we'll get it to work well. Thank you. 
Maureen, we don't have any sound. Is that normal? Hey, Maureen, we don't have any sound going. I can't hear you. Maureen, we don't have any sound for the video. Maureen, can you turn up the sound? Maureen, we don't have any sound. You may have to read the writing at the bottom. We had this problem the other day. Please mute yourselves, folks. You're blocking the screen. All right. People keep saying they couldn't hear. So um, I tried to turn that off. Um, and I'll try to get it started again. It, I did have on the uh, closed caption. Was it people weren't hearing it? Was that the problem? Yes, we couldn't hear anything. We could read, but not hear. Okay, I'll try. I'll try sharing the screen again and see uh, see if I forgot to click the video, because um, I could hear it. So I'll see if I tried to. I for, might have forgot to click the audio. I'll try to share the screen again. Can you see the Great Lakes part now? This says the Great Lakes. Can y'all see the Great Lakes slide? I can't no. see anything. Oh, no. Uh, it exhibits blank, little blank things with me. All right. All right. Let's get out, and I'll. Try sharing the screen again. So zoom. Zooming. Okay. Share screen. All right, I'm good. Can you see the uh, the video now? Yes. Can you, can yes. you see the slide now? Yes. Okay. Slideshow from current. Beginning. All right. So I'm going to try it one more time and see if uh, hopefully it'll work. All right. You share. so great about the Great Lakes. They're known as America's Inland Seas. The North American Great Lakes, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior are so massive that they border eight states and contain 23 quadrillion liters of water. That's enough to cover the land area of the contiguous United States three meters deep. 
These vast bodies of water span forest, grassland, and wetland habitats, supporting a region that's home to over 3,500 species. But how did such a vast and unique geological feature come to be? The story begins near the end of the last ice age, over 10,000 years ago, a time when the climate was warming and the glaciers that cloaked the Earth's surface began their slow retreat. These immense ice sheets carved out a series of basins. Those basins filled with water as the ice began to melt, creating the world's largest area of freshwater lakes. Over time, channels developed between these basins and water began to flow in an ongoing exchange that persists to this day. In fact, today, the interconnected Great Lakes contain almost 20% of the world's supply of fresh surface water. The water's journey begins in the far north of Lake Superior, which is the deepest, coldest, and clearest of the lakes, containing half the system's water. Lake Superior sinks to depths of 406 meters, creating a unique and diverse ecosystem that includes more than 80 fish species. A given drop of water spends on average 200 years in this lake before flowing into Lake Michigan or Lake Huron. Linked by the Straits of Mackinac, these two lakes are technically one. To the west lies Lake Michigan, the third largest of the lakes by surface area. Water slowly moves through its cul-de-sac shape and encounters the world's largest freshwater dunes, many wildlife species, and unique fossilized coral. To the east is Lake Huron, which has the longest shoreline. It's sparsely populated but heavily forested, including 7,000-year-old petrified trees. Below them, water continues to flow southeastwards from Lake Huron into Lake Erie. This lake's status as the warmest and shallowest of the five has ensured an abundance of animal life, including millions of migrating birds. Finally, the water reaches its last stop by dramatically plunging more than 50 meters down the thundering Niagara Falls into Lake Ontario, the smallest lake by surface area. From there, some of this well-traveled water enters the St. Lawrence River, eventually reaching the Atlantic Ocean. In addition to being a natural wonder, the perpetually flowing Great Lakes bring us multiple benefits. They provide natural water filtration, flood control, and nutrient cycling. By moving water across more than 3,200 kilometers, the Great Lakes also provide drinking water for upward of 40 million people and 212 billion liters a day for the industries and farms that line their banks. But our dependence on the system is having a range of negative impacts too. The Great Lakes coastal habitats are being degraded and increasingly populated, exposing the once pristine waters to industrial, urban, and agricultural pollutants. Because less than 1% of the water leaves the lake system annually, decades-old pollutants still lurk in its waters. Humans have also inadvertently introduced more than 100 non-native and invasive species into the lakes, such as zebra and quagga mussels, and sea lampreys that have decimated some indigenous fish populations. On a larger scale, climate change is causing the waters to warm, thus reducing water levels and changing the distribution of aquatic life. Luckily, in recent years, governments have started to recognize the immense value of this natural resource. Partnerships between the United States and Canada are underway to reduce pollution, protect coastal habitats, and halt the spread of invasive species. Protecting something as massive as the Great Lakes system will require the collaboration of many organizations, but the effort is critical if we can preserve the wonder of this flowing inland sea. CTA offers CTA endorsed disability and life insurance plans from The Standard to make it easy for you to get quality coverage you can trust at group rates. To learn more about CTA endorsed plans, visit ctamemberbenefits.org.
Hey, sorry about that. I didn't click out of it. Were, were you able to hear that one? Somebody yes, answered? Yeah. Yes. yes okay, that was good. Good. I think when, when I, I, I forgot to click the audio when I did this screen share. Um, I, and I, I practiced it before and clicked it. And then I think when I went off it, it, I guess it didn't stay. So I thought I had clicked it, but I did not. So I will try to remember to do that. This second video is very short and I don't even think it has any sound. It just shows the retreat of the glaciers. So let's see if we can get this one to, to work. Go back to the video. All right, that one didn't work. So let's see if I can get it to work now. Screen share. Let's take There are generally two types of glaciers. First, we have alpine glaciers, which form high up in the mountains and travel downhill like rivers of ice. Then we have continental glaciers. These are massive glaciers that cover entire land masses, and they tend to move outwards from the center, often towards the coast. Maureen, at first we had sound and then it went away. Yeah, that's the wrong video. That's why I made it go away. I'm trying to get rid of this video. Um, so here we go. Yeah. There we go. Okay. I think we're just going to move on because that other one didn't work well and I'm not going to go back to it. It just should. Okay, so as we we are going to go into t uh, talking about um, so Michigan, and I just wanted to um, here we'll go to this one. We're going to talk about Isle Royale National Park, Michigan, and I just wanted to um, talk about how we got there. I went there in 2017, and this was a trip that we took to. Uh, my husband and I wanted to get uh, have gotten to all 50 states. And I had four states left and he had five states left. So we were uh, trying to go to Iowa, Nebraska. The, I had been to South Dakota, but not North Dakota. He had not been to the Dakota. So Iowa, Nebraska, the Dakotas and Michigan, all in one trip. So we flew into Chicago and then we kind of made a big circle. So we got to go to all those five states and Michigan was both of our 50th state. So when we got to Michigan, we took a picture with the sign and I just thought that was kind of funny. So it took me a long time to get to Michigan. Uh, it was my last state, but uh, you know, no real reason. It's a really cool state. And I have a lot of good friends that are from Michigan, uh, but I just, it took me a while to get there, but I really enjoyed it when I did. And we got to go to a really special national park Isle Royale National Park, which is, is um, one of the least visited and least uh, accessible national parks. It is in Michigan. It is up in, uh, in Lake Superior. So um, you can't drive there. You have to either take a, a ferry or fly in. So we actually had to um, park our car and uh, take a ferry. We actually parked our car in one town I think you can take a ferry either from Duluth or Houghton 
and I think we had the we parked our car here in the house, and then we drew, we took a, a like a taxi kind of to the other place, a, a van, and then we took uh, we took our um, took this ferry, and then we came back on this ferry, and we stayed there two or three nights. I can't remember. Um, but uh, it, uh, that was the only way we could do it. We went very early in the season. It's, it's not open to visitors in the winter. Um, so we went very early in June. And uh, there's actually two places to stay there. Yeah, yeah, there's no, there's no uh, roads for cars. So once you get there, they have uh, like golf carts. And there's two places to stay there. And they will take your um, luggage to whichever place. And I, I wanted to try both places. So we stayed, uh, I think, the first uh, two nights or the first night, I, I guess we stayed three nights, in the... Um, in the uh, cabins, which are wonderful, but then I also wanted to try the hotel, and that didn't open till the last night we were there for the season, so we stayed the last night in the hotel, and they very nicely moved our luggage from the cabins to the hotel. Um, so they were both, if you go there, I would recommend either one. I may have liked the cabin a little bit better because you had more room uh, than the hotel room, but the hotel had definitely better views. So um, this is really worthwhile to visit this park. It's absolutely beautiful. A little bit hard to get to, but the ferry ride's very nice. It's several hours long. And, uh, and Isle Royale is, a, is part of an archipelago of islands that's in uh, Lake Michigan, or Lake uh, Superior, I'm sorry, and this is, the, this is the largest one. So Isle Royale National Park includes the large island, which is Isle Royale, is they actually say it Isle Royal, even though it has an E on the end and it looks like to me it should be Isle Royale, but they pronounce it up there, Isle Royal. And, um, and it also has 400 smaller islands that forms um, an archipelago. It's very forested. It's surrounded by the very deep and cold waters of Lake Superior, which is the largest North American Great Lake. And again, there are no roads on the island. It's a great place for hiking. We hiked everywhere when we were there. We, we did take one little boat tour around, you know, other parts of the island that we couldn't hike to. It's a great place for hiking, a great place. It's very peaceful, great place for relaxing, great place for bird watching. Um, and, and we didn't see too many wildlife. I am going to talk a little bit about the wolves and the moose. Um, as we get on that live there, but you know, and we saw some other smaller mammals. Um, and a por portion of the park's northern border within Lake Superior uh, um, comes, uh, goes up against the um, international border between the U.S. and Canada. Well, let's get into the geology a little bit. Um, the the, um, the uh, island is part of a, a, a sync syncline, which is a downfolded region. Um, and the, and the island is at the uh, end of the fold. I'll show a picture of that in a minute. And that's part of the Lake Superior Basin. Um, the folded rocks have a volcanic and sedimentary rocks that are interbedded. And the softer rocks in the center got um, you know, eroded away or carried away by the, uh, the ice sheet. So the rocks exhibit more than, there's 1 billion years of geologic processes, um, including volcanism and then sediment, sedimentation. And then, of course, uplift and erosion, and then you know glaciation. The Lake Superior Basin is an interesting geology. It, I already mentioned that it's a geological syncline. The syncline, remember, is the downfold, the U-shaped one. The anticline is the upfold, and they form from compressional forces. And this, and the area is also what they call a failed continental rift. Um, an example of a continental rift today is where Africa has, um, you know, uh, split apart uh, at the East African Rift. It's actually the continents rifting apart, and at the Red Sea, it's already rift, 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 rifted or ripped apart from uh, from uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And that, um, you know, like a billion years ago, that started to happen to what at that time was North America, but it never complete it. It just started to rift and then for some reason stopped. So um, that's what we call a failed rift, but that left it with a little bit of a downfold, down, I mean, a, you know, down dropped a little bit, a, a down dropped region, you know, just from the rifting. Um, so that was active. The rift was started to happen about 1.1 billion years ago. So it's very, very old. 
Um, and then the glacial erosion actually, and I mentioned this already, um, excavated or, you know, the softer rock from the middle of the downfold, the syncline area. So it was rifted first and then the syncline occurred later. Um, there's, there's some of the, um, the volcanic rocks are what they call the billion year old greenstone. And that's some of the largest, um, lava, it's largest rocks that are from a, uh, lava flow, one of the oldest and largest uh, lasting lava flow events on Earth, the remnant of that. And there's also that those igneous rocks have na native copper deposits from them, so they, that's been mined in that region and that um, influenced uh, human presence um, even thousands of years ago on the island. Um, early people were using the copper. So this is a, <clears throat> this is a diagram. Uh, you know, it's kind of a geologic cross section of the region. There's Lake Superior, Isle Royal is here. And then you can see the rocks underneath, and that's the syncline. There's two um, reverse faults on either side. And again, you know, a syncline is a downfold. And then these softer rocks in the middle were, um, were eroded away, you know, removed by the glaciation. And then that basin was filled up by Lake Superior. So over the glacial events recently, you know, the very old rocks, but the glacial events were recent over the last three million years, and that's what sculpted the landscape that you see today. Um, the resulting formation of, um, of Lake Superior um, effectively isolated Isle Royal from the rest of the continent. And so um, it, it also has a, a, a kind of a different ecosystem. We'll talk a little bit about the the wolves and the moose, you know, everything's kind of been isolated there. Um, and the glacial um, processes, of course, provided the foundation for developing the island's ecology. Here's some scenery. Um, you can see some of the, um, just the uh, sculpted scoured rocks that were scoured by the glaciers. And then there's also um, some beautiful, you know, little bodies of water, little lakes on the island. And these pictures were all taken by us when we went hiking. When we were there, we went hiking every day. One day we took a little part of the day, took a little boat ride around the island, but just beautiful scenery, beautiful hiking. Uh, you don't, there weren't that many people there. So you could go on hikes and not see, you know, a lot of other people. It was very, very nice. So that's, all, you know, that's us again, some of the scenery, um, you know, it feels like it's a lake, but, the, you know, the lake is so large, you know, you feel like you're like in the middle of an, an ocean to me almost, because it's fresh water, obviously, but it's, but it's, uh, you know, it's a very, very large lake and, you know, kind of very beautiful, isolated scenery. Um, there's, there's some more, um, and uh, you see a lot of birds very pretty for bird watching. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about the ecology because the animals there, particularly the wolves, because the island is isolated, the wolves uh, became very inbred and they started to die out. Now when we were there, uh, I think we heard a ranger talk about the moose and they were saying that the some of the moose, they used to think they were you know isolated too, but some of them actually have been able to, I guess, swim in there that seems kind of amazing because it's so far but some of them have actually you know there there has been actually new um you know m moose uh i guess added to the genetic pool but the wolves no the wolves were very inbred so for years they they were dying out and they were trying to decide well should we you know should we mess with nature and and add you know put wolves back there to you know get, to get them reintroduce them and um you know and, and i think they finally decided to do that but i have a couple of different videos on the the wolves and the moose hopefully they'll work right and uh get to uh watch them and i think the first one is about when they're trying to decide whether they should uh reintroduce the the wolves Isle Royal is an island, a rather remote island in the middle of Lake Superior, the biggest freshwater lake in the world. And on this island are a population of wolves and moose, and these wolves and moose interact with one another as predator and prey, the, with the wolves eating the moose, and the moose's primary cause of death being the, the wolves. They've been there for about 50 years together. 
interacting in this way. And for about the same amount of time, 50 years, uh, researchers from Michigan Tech University have been studying those interactions. The longer we study things on Isle Royale, the more and more we realize that our original understandings, they weren't very good. In fact, they're just plain old wrong. And the only way to, to get that is by continuing to watch to see that as it unfolds, it's a bit different than what you had previously thought. For many, many decades, we thought Isle Royal wolves were isolated, inbred, and showed no signs of, no bad signs of that inbreeding. And, we, and we, you couldn't be more wrong than to find out, well, they're not so isolated and they also suffer from this inbreeding. In a normal wolf population, about one in a hundred wolves would have some spinal type of deformity. On Isle Royal, it's about one in three wolves, so uh, the you know, 30 times the higher rate of, of deformities. But the other related thing is we thought for many, many decades that the wolves on Isle Royal were completely isolated. Well, we just recently this year found out that's not quite so true either. For about the last 13 years, we've been collecting the scats of wolves. From those scats, we can get the DNA, and from the DNA, we can get DNA fingerprints, and more or less identify one wolf from another, and figure out who the brothers and sisters are, and other family relationships, males and females, all that stuff we can get from these DNA. Well, what we discovered just in the past year is something that happened more than 13 years ago. In the year 1997, a wolf from Canada had come to Isle Royal. We knew about the identity of this wolf for a long time. We just never knew his heritage. We knew about him because he was, he was really quite a spectacular wolf. He was physically larger than all the other wolves on Isle Royale. He was, he was the leader of Middle Pack, which became one of the largest packs Isle Royale had ever seen under his leadership. His apparent superiority is, is one of the most strong signs you could ask for that the wolves on Isle Royale had in fact been suffering from inbreeding depression that they weren't doing so well because relatively speaking, he was, he was that much better. Isle Royal has been showing us uh, the, the two things that it's best at showing us. One is it shows us how, how easy it is for ecologists to, to get it wrong, how easy it is for ecologists to misunderstand how nature actually works. The other thing that Isle Royal is good at showing us is how it is that we need to think deeply about our relationship with nature in general. And how that comes into play has to do with, in the last three or four years, the wolves on Isle Royal have been, have been doing relatively poor. They've had quite a difficult time of it. Basically, if we go back to just a couple of years ago, say early 2009, there were four packs on Isle Royal and about 30 wolves on the island. In just those couple of years, we're down to now about 15 adult wolves and only one pack. It's been four decades since Isle Royal has been reduced to just a single pack, so this is a very uh, unusual time right now. At the moment, it's just the moose are a bit low in abundance. If the moose are low, there's not so much food for the wolves. Begs the question, why are the moose low? Well, the, one of the m important reasons why the moose are low ha has to do with climate change. Uh, the, the last 10 years have been fairly warm, and, and warm climate is bad for moose in a couple of different ways. They just don't do well in the summer heat. They, when it's hot, they don't eat as much, and when they don't eat as much, they're not getting ready for winter, and then winter, then they're not ready to, to make it through the whole winter. There's also a tick that bothers the moose, and that tick can have catastrophic effects on the moose. It can cause them to die in the winter time. But the, it turns out those ticks are really do quite well when it's warm out. The, the last kind of critical detail about the wolves right now is that there are at most two adult females on the island. And if, if those two adult females, if they die before making more pups that are females, that would be the end of the, of the wolf population. It, what it begs is, it begs the question, what would happen if those wolves go extinct? And the question is, you know, would it be right to reintroduce more wolves? The federally designated wildernesses, these are these places in our country where we are most proud about uh, humans not intervening and humans not having an impact. And so the usual management for a place like this is non-intervention. And here come some of the complexities. If wolves are doing poorly, 
because the moose are doing poorly, and if moose are doing poorly because of climate change, and if humans are the agents behind climate change, isn't that an occasion to maybe think about what's about intervening? In the last 50 years, the Lake Superior has gotten progressively warmer, and ice bridges don't form nearly as often now as they did before. And so the chances of wolves coming back on their own are, are quite slim for that reason. The Isle Royal is really just an example of, of what's kind of a big, important question for wilderness all across the United States, which is basically there really isn't not one square inch in our country that humans haven't heavily impacted, including our wilderness areas. These human impacts are probably just an occasion for us to kind of rethink what is our relationship with nature, what is our relationship with wilderness areas in particular, and Isle Royal and this question of what to do if wolves go extinct is, is, is going to play an important role in kind of leading our thoughts to, to that new stage. Wide open questions, they require broad dialogue with the relevant federal agencies, but it's, it's important for all citizens that, are, that have a stake with nature, which is, which is all citizens. So it's, it's a question for all of us, really. Okay, there's a couple more videos, so I'm going to try to... Um, oops. Okay. We'll try watching this one now. I believe this one's reintroducing the moose. decide to reintroduce the wolves and then I've got one more I think this one's on the moose saw this product, I thought it looked kind of crazy. Didn't really understand what the benefits would be, but uh, I had seen some
So, so if you get a chance to visit Isle Royal, it's really worthwhile. Um, it's, it's really a, an unusual, neat park, very isolated. Um, and I definitely would like to go back sometime. Um, on that same trip, we also visited uh, uh, Pictured Rocks, which is a national lakeshore. And one of the participants requested that I also talk about Sleeping Bear Dunes, which I did not get to visit, but I'd like to um, someday. So it'll be something to see when I go back to Michigan. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about um, those two areas. They're not national parks, but they are national lakeshores and very unique. So this map shows the location. Um, Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore is actually on um, Lake Superior. And then um, the uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes is actually, and, that, and this, uh, Pictured Rocks is on what they call the Upper Peninsula, the UP. And then the um, Sleeping Bear Dunes is on the Lower Peninsula and it's on Lake Michigan. So um, look at the Pictured Rocks first. Um, it's a really beautiful, beautiful, unique area. Um, you see these beautiful colored rocks. You can see some of them from, um, you know, points where you can drive and stop and look, but the best way to see them is to go on the boat tour. And depending on the time of day, the rocks can look, uh, you know, different, you know, different uh, colors from the different light. So, um, you know, it's, it's very neat. I think we went in the morning. Um, so pictured rocks are located on the south shore of the Upper Peninsula, and they are um, 50 to 200 feet tall sandstone cliffs. They go about 15 miles along the shoreline, and they've been sculpted by uh, weathering and waves. And um, again, uh, they represent, um, you know, a lot of times you see in these parks, you know, they represent in this, these areas, you see the very old rock, and then you see the more recent rock. So you see two widely separated geologic time intervals. You see the late Precambrian to early Ordovician. So these are the very old rock, 500, 800 million years ago. And then you also see the, you know, the stuff from the, you know, the uh, more recent time, you know, the late Quaternary. Um, so uh, these are your older rock. This is this is the area called um, Miner Miner's Castle. Kind of looks like a castle and this has got some of the very old rock this is uh the the little uh, geologic section of the munsing formation and some of its different members and and these have um fossils of trilobites in them and trilobites are you know very old extinct fossils that you know they're uh cambrian or division so they, they find those in some of these um members of the uh munsing formation which you can see in the miner's castle some of the views you see, this are some of our pictures from the cruise and you can see uh, there's some arches and, and then some uh, beautiful, um, you know, col the colors and you see the, uh, the mineral staining, you know, the iron staining on some of them that give the reds and the oranges. And uh, so that's a real neat thing to do if you go to Michigan and uh, you can do that in Isle Royale in the same trip. Sleeping Bear Dunes is a little farther. That's on the lower peninsula. So we did not get to go there. That's located on um, the northwestern part of the lower peninsula in Lake Michigan. But it does look really nice. I definitely would like to go back and go there. Uh, it contains um, geologically young sand dunes that formed after the glaciers retreated um, from some of the sediment eroded by the, the uh, glacial ice sheet. So that's one of the scenes from there and the, and the beautiful dunes on Lake Michigan. And these are some of the most unique dunes in the world. They're called perch dunes because the wind blows the sand up the glacial moraine. Remember the glacial moraine is what forms when the, gla when the glacial ice melts and the wind blows the sand up to form these uh, dunes that are perched on top of the cliffs. And, uh, and then there's some different types. Uh, well, there's somebody entering. All right. Um, and so they, they, there's, there's different names of dunes, a parabolic dune. These are all perch dunes because they're perched on top. But uh, the ones over here are like the linear dunes. That's the most common type of dune. And then the perch dunes kind of um, cover the, uh, they, they kind of are, you know, um, um, rounded kind of like an ice cream scoop and they cover the top of the end of the cliff but they're all the all of the perch type um, 
that you know the wind the wind blew the sand up the moraine and then across so um you know it's kind of covers the top of the cliffs which is which is not a common type of dune so very interesting geologically so during the pleistocene the continental glacier spread southward from canada and buried the areas under ice like you saw in the pleistocene ice sheet um, and then the perch dunes are dunes that were formed by the glacial sands deposited on on the cliffs or the plateaus high above the shore and they are um, a beautiful example of this type of dune one of the best examples in the world it's considered so these are some of the beautiful pictures that you can see the scenery um, if you could go there so if if you've never been to michigan or to some of these places all look like really nice places to plan for one of your upcoming trips okay so we are finished with the glacier uh, parks. Anybody have any glacier questions before we move on to the caves? Okay, well, we're going to move on to talk about uh, cave parks, and then we're also going to talk about the Permian Reef. We probably won't get to that one this week, um, but we are going to start talking about caves and karst. So, yeah, we go. There we are. Excuse me, Maureen. I do have a question. Okay. I couldn't get unmuted for a minute there. Uh, what would the Great Lakes have looked like without the glacial period? What did they actually contribute? It looked in the earlier period like the Great Lakes were actually there before the glaciers. So it really had surface effects. It wasn't what formed the lakes, is that correct? Well, they might have still been there because they were, there was the syncline and the depressions, but they wouldn't have been as deep or as large. So, it did, have been... so it did actually make them deep. Where did it oh, yeah. the deposits? Pardon me? If there was that much material that was moved, like from Lake Superior, shouldn't there be mountains somewhere rather than the kind of flattish lands around it? No, it can't, it got, some of the material got carried away in, in dunes. Some of it got deposited uh, in the Midwest. They have good farming area. You know, it got carried, a lot of it got carried away in rivers. And, you know, like the whole Mississippi River drainage system was formed then too. So a lot of it just got carried away by rivers and the drainage too. And so, in the earlier pictures, it looks like the drainage was actually all down the Mississippi, but then it switched at some point. Was that primarily because of the glaciers that the drainage is now out the St. Lawrence? Yeah, the, the, the glaciers formed all of that drainage that we have now. The St. Lawrence, the Mississippi, Hudson Bay, all that stuff was formed by, and all the Great Lakes, all that was formed by the melting of the Pleistocene ice sheet. And that was probably because uh, the glaciers tended to push more of the earth to the south and thus blocked off the original drainage down the Mississippi? Well, the, it's, it created the drainage down the Mississippi too, but it probably, yeah, it probably blocked off some of it, Rhea, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's see if we can share this one. Okay, anything else before we move on to the caves? Maureen, I was wondering about the connections between the lakes. Are they like a series of canals and locks now, or uh, how are they manipulated by people to make them functional for shipping? And know a lot about that, but I suspect they've been dredged some to, and they have, you know, I know they have locks there, but I'll have to look into that, figure that out a little bit, because I, I don't, I did not go to school or grow up at all in the Midwest, and that, and a lot of this I had to kind of teach myself. I don't know a lot about the geology, but uh, I will try to look that up and and see if I can figure that out and mention it next week at the beginning of class. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. All right. Write that down. <laughs> Anything else? All right, we're going to st uh, start talking about uh, the, the uh, parks that have caves. Um, and I'm going to talk about, let's see, slideshow. Let's see. Let me zoom. No, that went back to my old slideshow. <laughs> share screen. We want to do this one. Share. Okay, there we go. 
we're going to talk about um, karst topography first because we're going to see that in uh, some of our cave areas. And then the national parks that I'm going to cover in this uh, section, which will start today and finish next week, are uh, Mammoth Cave in Kentucky and then Wind uh, Cave in South Dakota, Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico. And then we're gonna also talk about uh, the Perian Basin and the Guadalupe Mountains National Park, which is in uh, West Texas, but it's, it's related to the Carlsbad Cavern area. The whole Permian Basin is very interesting. So uh, we're gonna start out just talking about karst. Um, we actually live in a karst region um, so we should all know a little bit about karst since Florida has a lot of karst. Karst is a, a landscape underlying primarily by the rock limestone or some other carbonate rock. Dolomite is another example of a carbonate rock where, um, and where the rock, and it's usually limestone because that's the most common one, is being dissolved by groundwater. And um, the, the way that happens is that water reacts with carbon dioxide in the soil and the atmosphere. And when they uh, chemically react, they form a weak acid called carbonic acid. And that acid um, will work slowly to dissolve the rocks along weak areas like bedding planes, fractures and joints. And this happens, you know, it, this isn't a very strong acid. So it's not like when I uh, have my geology and earth science classes, I always get hydrochloric acid and I put that on limestone and it dramatically fizzes and, uh, you know, you can see that, you know, the dissolving away of the rock very quickly. But uh, the carbonic acid is much weaker and it, and it dissolves the rocks very slowly, you know, on, you know, long hundreds and thousands of years along these uh, weak bedding planes. And it forms uh, fractures, joints, and eventually caves and sinkholes, which we're pretty familiar with uh, sinkholes in Florida. So this is what happens. You have, uh, you know, the water and the uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, and that forms uh, what this is. It's that weak carbonic acid, H2CO3, and that will work its way down through, uh, there's always going to be little fractures and joints and cracks and crevices in the rock, and it'll very slowly start to dissolve, and then they get bigger and bigger till eventually you end up with uh, caves and caverns and maybe even a sinkhole. These, these things just grow larger and larger. Um, some of the features that you find in karst regions, and we have these around here, are not geysers, but we have a springs. Uh, a geysers are, um, you know, where you have a hot spring. We don't have a, we, we don't have that here because we don't have a hot magma near the surface, but places like Yellowstone have those. Um, caves and caverns, which we do have around here. Um, sinkholes. And then disappearing streams, streams that um, will be flowing and then all of a sudden they'll go underground because they've gone down into, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a little sinkhole or little area that is, uh, you know, um, a depression underground. 10% of the Earth's surface um, is karst terrain. And one quarter of the world's population, including most of us in Florida, get our water supply from karst regions. So karst is, is very, very important. It's important to understand. Okay, so I have a little video uh, about karst and uh, hopefully we can get that to work well. USA, a typical small town from middle America, but just below the surface, a not-so-typical situation is exposed. Karst. Karst, Karst. Comprising some 25% of America, karst areas offer unique challenges when it comes to water management. But what is karst, and why does it matter to me? Karst refers to landscapes formed primarily by the dissolving away of rock. Weak acids and rainwater eat away rocks such as limestone, gypsum, and other easily dissolvable materials. This results in typical features which include caves, sinkholes, and underground streams. One of these underground streams provides the groundwater Karstville relies on for its water. When we 
think about the ground under our feet, if we do at all, we tend to assume that it is a solid mass, nothing but dirt and rock all the way down to the core. While this is true for much of the underground, we also know that there are many holes formed by a wide range of processes. When these holes are big enough for people to enter, we call them caves. Where these holes, tiny or large, are filled with water, we call them aquifers. Aquifers are giant subterranean reservoirs that supply drinking water for 37% of the country. Yet these water reservoirs can suffer drought and flood like their surface cousins. There are different types of aquifers depending upon type of rock. A porous media aquifer occurs where water is stored and flows through spaces between small grains. Porous media aquifers are the most common types of aquifer, often composed of sandstones and gravel. Water movement is dependent upon the size of the grain, with smaller grains restricting water movement. By contrast, a karst aquifer is formed predominantly by water dissolving openings in the rock along fractures. The Swiss cheese topology, with its much larger interconnecting conduits, is much more conducive to rapid water movement. Karst groundwater mostly flows through these conduits, which include caves, but generally refer to openings that are hydrologically identical to caves, but are too small for human access. While a large volume of groundwater is stored in tight, small fractures and other openings, more than 94% of the groundwater that readily moves through karst aquifers is moving through conduits. In a porous aquifer, springs diffuse from a relatively broad area through the granular material. However, in karst aquifers, springs flow from conduits. Since the conduit carries more water and focuses it in certain locations, karst springs typically discharge greater volumes of water and form most of the largest springs in the world. When rain hits the surface above a porous media aquifer, the water moves slowly between the grains of sand and down the water table. Prolonged rock-water interaction helps to filter water of contaminants, both natural and man-made. In a karst aquifer, conduits allow surface water to reach the water table very quickly, often resulting in an immediate rise in the water table. Conduits thus allow karst aquifers to refill more rapidly than other types of aquifers. But their very short rock-water interaction times allows effectively no filtration of contaminants. Wells are holes drilled or dug into the ground to remove groundwater, monitor groundwater, or inject liquid wastes for storage and disposal. Note that wells can extend to different depths depending on needs and costs. Deeper wells are more expensive than shallow wells. When pumping water from the deep well in a porous media aquifer, the rate of water removal causes a cone of depression, a sunken or funnel-shaped area of the water table. Friction between the sand grains holds the water table at different elevations, and gravity pushes the water down to where pumping occurs. When pumping water from a well in karst aquifers, the water is much more easily and rapidly removed compared to porous media aquifers. Cones of depressions don't form as easily because water flows quickly in conduits with few frictional forces to slow the flow. Karst aquifers can be rapidly drained and refilled. The conduits that allow water to move so quickly in and out of karst aquifers also make them the most vulnerable type of aquifer to pollution. Contaminants in karst aquifers are poorly filtered, if at all. They move rapidly along hard to predict flow paths and travel along conduits that are extremely difficult to find by drilling. Intercepting a significant volume of contaminants by well access is highly unlikely. A sinkhole is a natural depression in karst areas shaped to funnel water into the aquifer. Surface water reaches the water table quickly through conduits and results in a rapid rise in the water table. Various pollutants such as chemicals on lawns, leaking sewers, septic systems, landfills, or gasoline spilled on the road move slowly toward the water table in porous media aquifers, but far more quickly through the conduits and caves found in karst aquifers. Pollutants travel directly to the water table and can quickly appear in well water. Surface activities can affect karst aquifers much more quickly and dramatically than porous media aquifers. 
agricultural runoff from farm operations, as well as domestic animal operations, such as stockyards, can rapidly impact these areas. Likewise, with industrial operations and even municipal water treatment, the speed at which pollutants can enter the water table can often be measured in hours and even minutes. Gasoline stations and other operations that rely on underground storage of hazardous liquids can leak from corroded tanks and enter karst aquifers in short order. Internationally, significant development over karst aquifers has consistently resulted in their contamination. Best management practices for karst aquifers should minimize the placement of materials over aquifers that can contaminate groundwater and to use the best available technology to contain and filter those materials if placement away from the karst is not an option. What can your community do? The National Cave and Karst Research Institute recommends the four-point ATOM approach to karst groundwater management. Adopt karst management plans. Designate non-development zones. Avoid developing on karst. And minimize pollutant loading on karst. Needless to say, it makes sense to pay attention to what's under our feet. Okay, that was probably a little too much information, but since we live in a karst region, I thought that was kind of good that we all get a kind of a pretty good understanding of that. Um, this is uh, just a cave, you get caves in karst region. And like I said, Florida is a karst region. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this is a very famous thing called Olin Winter Park. Um, probably most of you or everybody's heard of it, called the Winter Park Sinkhole. It formed in 1981. And you can see it took a lot of roads, buildings, things with it. Now it is just a lake in Winter Park, but this was a big deal in 1981. Um, this is a, if you look at a, um, in a, you know, an aerial photo of um, near Cape Canaveral, you can really see the karst topography in Florida. We kind of look like Swiss cheese. Um, and then this again shows uh, how a karst lake formed. This is the, again that winter park, very famous winter park sinkhole, which uh, you know the, the ground collapsed and uh, and uh, you know, now it's a lake. Um, so what? How do they form? Um, a lot of times people, or if you hear a news story, or people will say, "Oh, this this karst uh, this sinkhole formed. It just formed very suddenly." But that's not really true. Um, these form over very long periods of time by dissolution of the rock, like I said, from the, you know, carbonic acid. And underneath in the, um, in the, you know, limestone, you have dissolution going on for a very long period of time. And these little cracks and crevices will start to uh, dissolve and then they, you know, get larger and then they start to, you know, combine with other ones. So you end up with a, a cavity underground. Now you still have that, you know, overlying material. So from the surface, you can't see anything. But as, uh, you know, as it continues to enlarge, it's going to get to a point where it can no longer support whatever's on the surface. And that's then when your karst, um, you know, when your sinkhole collapse forms. That's when your sinkhole forms and then eventually it can fill it up to be a lake. But it's actually forming over a long period of time. You just, the, the collapse happens suddenly because uh, it can no longer support, the ground underneath can no longer support the surface. Um, yeah, this is another karst feature of springs and you know we have very large springs in Florida because we are a karst region so Wakulla Springs is one of the examples of that um, and again this kind of shows what's happening how does a sinkhole form well again it's forming very slowly underground and uh, we don't you know we have probably a lot of these forming in, in, um, in Florida even in you know in our region occasionally we'll hear about a sinkhole you know, that opens up, but they've been forming for a very long time. They do can do ground penetrating radar to look for these, but when they develop areas because it's expensive, a lot of times they don't. So, um, you know, people aren't aware of it a lot of times until the actual collapse happens. 
but it's been happening over a long period of time. But then finally, when it can no longer support, it collapses. You also get uh, disappearing streams. Uh, if you go on the Leon Sinks hike, um, which is, you know, in Leon County, if you've ever been on that, they have, there's a disappearing stream that you can see there. The stream just goes underground and then appears somewhere else um, because of the karst. Any questions about karst before we move on to uh, the largest karst region in the world, or one of the largest karst regions in the world in Kentucky, Mammoth Cave National Park? Karst questions? Okay, well, we will move on to um, Mammoth Cave National Park, which is in Kentucky. And it's actually one of the drivable national parks from here. Um, a lot of the national parks you can't get to easily, but um, of course, Smoky Mountains National Park, you can drive to in a day. Uh, the Everglades, you can drive to in a very long day. And then Mammoth Cave National Park, you can also drive to in a day from here. So um, if you're looking for, you know, when we, whenever we can uh, go places again, if you're looking for a place to go, this one is not very far. Um, this is a uh, Mammoth Cave National Park and that's uh, what there's, you, when you go there, there's several different tours you can do of the cave. Everything from just, a, you know, a one hour very short tour to, you know, a half a day or a whole day. And then there's different entrances. They have a historic tour. I think they have a lantern tour, and then this is the uh, this is the mo uh, the um, the regular entrance, I guess. The traditional this is the traditional tour. We went on two when we went. This is actually me and my son, and we went about ten years ago, and we went on um, on the this tour, and which is like several hours long, and then we also went on the historic tour the next day. So Mammoth Cave is the longest known cave in the world. It's got over 300 miles of um, explored and mapped passageways and there's, there's much more to it. They're still exploring it and it's getting larger all the time. Um, it's formed in a nearly flat lying limestone um, by a circulation of groundwater. Um, and it's, it's fed by infiltration from the surface. Um, the um, cave enlargement is still continuing and uh, the lowest levels of the cave still have streams that are actually running underwater. And this uh, region is the most extensive karst region in the United States and one of the most extensive in the world. If you look at its geologic tectonic setting, um, the, they're sedimentary rocks and they were deposited in a shallow sea that covered much of North America during the Mississippian era um, the Mississippian is uh, Paleozoic, so it, um, it's pretty old, 350 to 325 million years old, ago. Um, the major rock type is limestone, but there's also some uh, sandstone and shale, and especially at the top, that forms a calf rock, um, which it's, um, really controls uh, how the cave was formed. We'll talk more about that. There's three different limestone formations. The gherkin is the youngest, and that's uh, or, or, and then um, that's underlain by the St. Genevieve, and then the oldest, the St. Louis limestone is on the bottom. So those are your three, the three layers. And then I, I mentioned the top has the um, classic material. There's a sandstone and shale cap rock at the top, and that's called the Chester Formation or the Chester Series. And that is resistant because that sandstone and shale does not dissolve um, by the carbonic acid. So um, that kind of controls how the cave is. Um, in areas that, that, that it's fractured, then you can get the water, uh, you know, the, the uh, ac acidic water going through and dissolving the limestone. In some areas where it's not fractured and, and where it's covering up, it cannot make it through. So uh, we'll talk more about that when we talk about the cave. Here's uh, just the geologic time scale. So you can see um, the, the um, Mississippian is in here. It's like um, mid, mid to late, late mid Paleozoic. There's your Paleozoic, your Precambrians down here. The Paleozoic era starts at about 542 million. But here the Mississippian is in the 300 million range. And um, you know, that's actually called the Carboniferous. You had a lot of coal deposits at that time. 
Okay, so Mammoth Cave is called an erosional cave. Now, when we talk about Carlsbad Caverns, Carlsbad Caverns is more what we call a solution ca cavern or a solution cave. So they're different. They're kind of interesting to compare and contrast. Mammoth Cave is an erosional cave, which is formed from water flowing through the cracks and passages at, near, or above the water table. Now, again, that surface cap rock has to be cracked and uh, broken where the water can get, actually get through to the limestone. There's a lot of, um, the area has a lot of sinkholes, funnel-shaped depressions that drain the underground in the karst region. And again, the area is one of the finest examples of a karst region in the world. The region contains hundreds of thousands of sinkholes. Again, you look at it, that's the sinkhole plain. You can see them everywhere. You know, again, it looks like Swiss cheese. That's what the region looks like. Uh, there's a cross section of the Kentucky karst region, uh, and you can see the uh, you know, different caverns. Um, some of them have streams, and then the sinkholes, which drain water down through. And then that's again um, the showing the karst region. Uh, the rain that falls outside the park travels underground to help sculpt the mammoth cave and you know erode the material in in you know and form the erosional cave the plants and animals live on that live in the cave depend on the uh, quantity and quality of the water also and of course human activities you know like we saw in the you know in the glacier park and in the um information on isle royal you know human activity always affects the ecology and the environment. And again, if you see, you can see the sandstone cap rock on the top and then the layers of limestone. Um, this is actually in the Mammoth Cave Park and I don't know if it's real obvious, but there's a sinkhole here. This is a picture that I took, so there's a sinkhole. Um, disappearing or sinking streams, they have a lot of those in the area. The master stream that has come through and caused the erosion is the Green River. And Mammoth Cave is related to the, the hydrology of the Green River and the karst topography in the area. That's why it formed from the combination of the two. Um, it contains relatively few solution features um, and cave deposits. And that's because it has that sandstone and shale cap rock. So the only place you can get the cave deposits and the solution features like the, um, you know, stalactites and stalagmites and the columns and things like that are where the water can drip down. So the, um, in areas in the cave that have those, the sandstone and shale cap rock is, is fractured or missing, you know, eroded away at the, you know, above that. That's how the you know, solution features can come down and form. So cave deposits, there's the solution features, the technical term for them is speleothems, and that's cave formations that form from um, minerals that precipitate out of the water that drips down. And so you get the, um, and some areas of this cave do have these, but they're not, you know, um, found totally throughout the cave because again of the cap rock. But you do see these in some areas. We'll look at the area called the frozen Niagara. It has some beautiful uh, cave formations. So flow stones is the sheets or draperies that form when uh, water runs over the cave wall. Stalactites are deposited by water dripping from the cave ceiling. So stalactites, I always think of it, they hang tight from the ceiling and it has a C in there. So stalactites from the ceiling. And then stalagmites are the ones that form when the water hits the floor and they come up from the ground. So you can look at the G in there and remember the ground. So they come up from the ground, stalagmites. And then where they actually join together and they meet, uh, sometimes it'll form a, a solid column. Travertine is a type of limestone. Um, when the water becomes super saturated and, um, and um, so it precipitates, so if, if it becomes super saturated, some of the limestone is going to precipitate out as this travertine deposit. And so you get some um, 
flowstones and uh, some stalactites, stalagmites, and, and all the formations you see of those types in the cave are travertine. But you also get gypsum flowers, which is another evaporite mineral that grows from the walls in the cave. So these are some of the different types of cave deposits that you see there. And then um, they study the caves and um, the streams that came through and formed these passages they can tell whether the velocity of the stream was high or whether it was low, whether it was a fast or slow flowing stream by looking at some of the features. So the streams that, that where there's a, a fast flowing streams, if it was a fast flowing stream, you're gonna see a rocky floor, steep passages, um, canyons and, and uh, small scallops um, formed in the, in the rocks, some small scallop formations and tight curves and meanders. If it was a slow forming stream that formed the passages, instead of seeing rocks on the floor, you're going to see silt and sand, you're going to see more level passages, you're going to see tubes rather than canyons, and you're going to see larger scallops and sweeping curves. So they actually study this to try and see what type of a, was it a high velocity or low velocity stream that flowed through. This is an area of the cave that's very beautiful. I think it's included on even the very short tours of the cave where you can, um, you know, you're not in there very long. You don't have to hike a lot. They take you down to the frozen Niagara and you can see the flow stone and the drapery. It's a very, very beautiful part of the cave. And there's some more, I think these are pictures that I took again, uh, some stalactites and stalagmites and some columns. And then these are those gypsum flowers. Gypsum is a different mineral that precipitates out of the water and uh, forms those beautiful flowers on the, um, that you don't ever want to touch. Don't ever want to touch any of these cave formations. The, one of the neat things about uh, Mammoth Cave that I really like, because we went on a long, several hour long tour, it has a restaurant in the cave. And that is, um, that's kind of a you know unusual. It's the only cave I've ever been in that has a restaurant and uh, been to several. And so you can actually stop on your tour and they give you time to buy your food and eat your lunch. And then you can also see it has a lot of graffiti on it. And um, of course now you're, you'd be arrested and heavily fined if you did this. But back in the day, many, many years ago when they had uh, cave tours uh, and they used lanterns, people uh, left this graffiti. So now it's kind of a historic thing. There's some more, and this is a, the dining room is actually called the snowball dining room. And that's some of the gypsum, gypsum deposits on the ceiling. This is uh, another, the, there's another uh, tour that we took the next day called the uh, historic tour. And this takes you through the Salt Peter uh, works. They actually mined this, I think uh, before the civil war. Um, saltpeter is potassium nitrate. It's used for a lot of things. I think they use it to preserve meat and things today, but back then they used it to make gunpowder. And so it, this is the le what's left over of the mining works uh, that they did in the 1800s. And then this is some of the interesting graffiti, historic graffiti from these old tours. And uh, I took a picture of this one because I'm from Philadelphia and it looks like somebody from Philadelphia wrote on there. And again, yeah, these are all old because you can't do this anymore. <laughs> um, one of the most interesting things that I found, uh, historic things about um, when I went to Mammoth Cave was uh, uh, the, the first, um, when some of the first cave explorers were slaves. And this uh, gentleman's name was Stephen Bishop, and he is a very famous cave explorer there. He was one of the first slave guides at Mammoth Cave. His, um, his owner was, you know, owned the land. And uh, he was, um, I guess, brought to this area in 1838 when he was in his late teens. And he learned, um, he, he was learned to tour um, from the original uh, guides that were, that were not slaves, that were white guides. He, um, he was taught how to be a cave guide. They may, the owner of the, of the land at the time made a lot of money by, you know, having tourists go through as cave guides and of course the guides you know they had, they had lanterns back then it wasn't lit like it is today and uh Stephen Bishop became one of the tour guides 
and uh, he was still a slave, but that, you know, that's what his job was on, on, you know, for his owner. And, but one of the things he did was he was, he was apparently very brave and he ventured beyond the tour areas and on his own, he uh, discovered a lot of many miles of the cave. He was the first one to explore it and discover it that nobody had ever seen. And that, you know, it's pretty dangerous, you know, and he went by himself. And um, so it's a, he, you know, he, he uh, kind of paved the way for modern exploration of the cave. He crossed a deep vertical shaft, which now you can go on on the tour called Bottomless Pit, which if you just imagine going through that in the dark with a lantern, you know, back in the 1800s by yourself, that had to be pretty scary. Uh, but he explored that areas and he discovered some of the very famous areas of the cave today, places such as Fat Man's Misery, which is hard to walk through, um, narrow, Cleveland Avenue and Mammoth Dome. So he explored a lot of the cave and uh, took, you know, took people on tours. He was apparently a very good tour guy. There's people that left like diaries writing about him. He was very engaging, very interesting to listen to. He unfortunately died uh, very young. I think he was only 37 years old and it didn't say how he died. Uh, I don't think he died in the cave, but it didn't say how he died back then people died young a lot I guess but um and he was only 37 so he's buried on Mammoth Cave uh, in the park so you can actually see his grave and some of the other early explorers of the cave are buried there too but I just think his story is very interesting um it is almost time to stop I've got a couple of really cool videos where you can actually um there's a, one on, on the Mammoth Cave, and then there's one on uh, the ge uh, geology tour of the cave. And I'm not going to show that whole thing, but um, I think this is probably a good place to, um, to stop because it's almost 1130, and I'll start here next week. And then next week, we'll also cover um, uh, Wind Cave and Carlsbad Caverns and... Um, and uh, we'll fit, you know, we'll finish up with the uh, uh, Guadalupe Mountain. So, anybody have any questions or comments um, before we Thank end? Thank you, Maureen. Another really, really great class. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. And don't forget to register for the June classes on our website um, at the Tallahassee Senior Foundation.org. Try that. Let me know how that goes. If you know, I'm hoping I'll see some more people registered by next week. And uh, thanks a lot. And uh, We'll see you next Thursday. All right. Bye. Thank Bye. you.